Madam Beck, thank you very much for your time and welcome to Ukraine's public broadcaster. After uh, Focus Online published your and your colleagues' uh, appeal, there were already two statements regarding two shipments of heavy weapons to Ukraine. Uh, the one was uh, about uh, three Flakparns and uh, Jeopard, uh, which are already uh, in Ukraine, as Ukraine's minister said. Another is about three Mars II systems. Uh, does this uh, statement somehow uh, cancel out your dissatisfaction? No, it does not. Uh, I mean, everybody who has just a glimpse of uh, how many weapons are being used by the Russian side and thus necessary for the Ukrainian side, this is like, uh, how we say, a drop on the hot stone. So um, it is no secret anymore that the German government has been absolutely reluctant on helping Ukraine uh, with weapons. I think we will talk about the reasons. And also there is, fortunately, I would say, different opinions on that question within our government. If to speak about uh, reasons, uh, in your opinion, um, what is the problem with German arms supply to Ukraine. During these few months, we've heard different versions of reasons from uh, the German leadership. Do you see what are um, the specific reasons of such behavior and the reluctance of uh, supplying Ukraine with heavy weapons? Yes, there, it's a whole bunch of reasons. I think to start with is looking back and uh, looking at Germany's relationship with Russia. Uh, even in 2015, when Crimea had already been annexed and uh, Russia had already intervened in uh, the Donbass and Luhansk region, because this war would not have been possible without Russian support. We know it, and we know that MH17 was brought down uh, by Russian. Uh, uh, military. Still in 2015, Germany made that uh, a treaty on uh, gas and Nord Stream 2. Now, even with Nord Stream 1, which already was a scandal because the Chancellor who had prepared the deal a few months later was on the board of the company, which is definitely not correct. Uh, even Nord Stream 1, and I remember that very well because I was parliamentarian, the, the Eastern European countries uh, already said this pipeline is nothing but a geostrategic weapon from Russia. Actually, pipelines and uh, um, bringing them through the Baltic Sea, they are way too expensive. They would be much uh, more cheap uh, having it on the uh, land, you know, leading it through Belarus, Poland, and so on. So definitely with Nord Stream 1, Russia already started this geostrategic game, and we even repeated it, and thus uh, made our having to rely on, on Russian gas, we topped that in 2015, when we could have seen that we had to do with an aggressive imperial power that obviously was starting to recollect its zone of influence. So if we speak about reasons um, why we have uh, such a situation with heavy weapons from Germany, you think it's uh, some uh, business connections with Russia or this is a fear uh, of Russia? How would you name it, if to name it shortly? Well, it's not only business connections. I think even more so is the political uh, connection. There still is a very deep wish within Germany to be on good terms with Russia, which is okay <laughs> when you think about people. But what Germany refused 
to be aware of is that the Putin system was a mixture out of KGB and Mafia and that they were reaching out to destabilize all of Europe to interfere in the United States like they did with Trump and uh, to really destroy liberal democracies. And this, unfortunately, was not being seen by the German government, and I must say, not by the Christian Democrats and not by the Social Democrats. Here in Ukraine, we sometimes have discussions uh, if uh, the behavior of Ukrainian leadership could somehow influence these relations between Ukraine and Germany during the full-scale invasion. How do you think? Uh, we remember the rather sharp statements by uh, already former Ambassador Melnik, plus there was uh, um, this story with uh, President Steinmeier uh, visit to uh, Kiev. Did it influence somehow how um, you know, Olaf Scholz's government uh, behaves now? Well, I would say it did not help. But uh, the reasons are much deeper. And this is about this special German-Russian relations. Uh, other countries surrounding us, especially the Baltic states and Poland, are very irritated. They had not expected this a German-Russian liaison being so deep. And uh, so, like I say, uh, to a certain extent, I could understand Ambassador Melnik because he had become bitter uh, during those years and experiencing so much, not taking Ukraine serious, uh, letting the hybrid warfare in disinformation, letting the Russian side going on with that, the trolls, Russia today um, accusing Ukraine of uh, being aggressive itself. I mean, it was really hard to stand. So, uh, like I say, to a certain extent, I can... Um, I can understand an ambassador becoming bitter, but of course, from the professional side, a diplomat must stay a diplomat. On one hand, uh, there is your and your colleagues' appeal. On the other hand, there are appeals from other representatives of, in particular, uh, German society, which say that German, Germany should stop sending weapons to Ukraine and incline Ukraine to negotiations and uh, some compromise. Uh, which of these two positions, in your opinion and your observation, um, have more uh, support in Germany? Well, definitely, there is more support by the wide population in all parties but the right wing and small and left wing. But the, the majority of our population has understood that Ukraine is doing nothing but using its right, which is stated in international law, fighting against an aggressive war, where you have a lot of war crimes, where you have crimes against humanity, and even we expect that someday we will come to the conclusion that there is genocide within this war, take the city of, of Mariupol or Bucha. So I think the vast uh, population is understanding that when you are attacked, uh, you must fight back. This, those voices which you have uh, from intellectuals, intelligentsia, they call themselves, and the reluctance of mainly the Social Democratic Party and thus the Chancellor's office, has to do with a very strange uh, conclusion from German history. I mean, us in Germany, we should understand with a totalitarian system like we had uh, in, the, in the 30s and 40s, which destroyed all of Europe, that it had to be fought down. And that now the next 
generation, next next generation, the, the grandchildren or even great grandchildren generation coming out with a statement that you rather should not fight. It's like they never looked back into German's history and they never took the perspective of the Poles, of the French, of the British, of the Soviet Union, um, that of course had the right and had to fight uh, this totalitarian system down. Just think about it, it wouldn't have happened. I mean, it was too late, almost too late for the Jewish population. And on top of that, we have the specific responsibility towards Ukraine. Uh, it is unbelievable, unbelievable that obviously so many people have no awareness that the Second World War was not being fought against Russia, like Putin's propaganda tries to make us think. But this war was being fought against the Soviet Union. And within the Soviet Union, we had a socialistic republic of Ukraine. And the main atrocities took place, and the fighting took place in those states from the Baltic Sea down to the Black Sea, which is the Baltic states, Poland, today's Belarus, and Ukraine. So if there is a specific responsibility, it lies in Germany. And we should be aware of that. And for me, it is, it is unbelievable that this um, awareness is not there uh, again. In 2016, 2017, my fraction handed in a resolution in uh, which was called German historical responsibility towards Ukraine, which was somehow Timothy Snyder's bloodland. And the social democratic fraction was not willing to go along. So it has long lines and long roots. And this is, I think, the uh, explanation for the reluctance. When the war started, Every, everybody thought within three days it will be over. <laughs> and now everybody seems to be surprised. There still is the illusion that you can negotiate with Putin and that maybe you can stop the war at the borders of Luhansk and Donetsk. And, well, <laughs> they don't answer what happens then. They don't answer all the atrocities, uh, the rape, the deporting, when Russia manages to take over in the cities and uh, in, in the countryside. So those voices, they are ignorant, they are arrogant against Ukraine, and I'm very upset again that this comes from Germany. We should know it better. I want to ask you if anything is changing in Germany now. You are saying about some things, in particular, this very specific German-Russian relation, um, which uh, took f so long yeah, to um, become like that. Is it changing under the influence of this full-scale invasion of Ukraine? Yes, I think it is changing. If you take uh, the German politics in January 27 this year, uh, the foreign minister still said we will not send any weapons. Uh, a month later, the chancellor talked about this Zeitenwende, I don't know how you can translate it, which was for German thinking almost a revolutionary statement, uh, understanding that those times where we thought we all, all we have is friends within Europe, <laughs> um, is not true anymore. I would say it has not been true for a long time. We could have known earlier, but again, and they understood that they have to invest into our German military, which is totally run down. And NATO and the United States have been asking Germany for a long time to really take their share 
and Germany didn't want to. We rather made other programs for poor people, for sustainable energy, and which is all necessary, but uh, if you take the aggressiveness of Russia into account, it was irresponsible to run the military down so much. So this is a revolutionary change, and take my green colleagues, a very young fraction, most of them being in parliament for the first time, I think many of them thinking that they could go for a pacifist, feminist, uh, foreign politics, they are now confronted with such a very nasty reality and they are doing pretty good. So this is the big change, but on the other side, there's still, the de is missing the decidedness to send the signal to Putin, we are not going to accept. And the fact that our chancellor is saying, um, Ukraine shall not lose the war, period. But not saying Putin or the Russian military must be besieged. I think they understand very well uh, in Sochi or Moscow what that means. And it would be totally necessary that not only the German chancellor, but the American uh, government and EU as a whole says, we think that if we want to live safe within Europe, if we want to have a European peace order according to law and rules, Putin's military must be besieged. And this, unfortunately, is not that clear yet within our statements, and any unclearness is being seen and used by Putin. What should happen for that? Because as you said, we don't hear it now. And we already saw Bucha, Irpin, we already saw Mariupol. What should happen to make uh, German Chancellor Olaf Scholz say things like you are saying? I can't tell you. I don't have a recipe for it. I know that the foreign minister and the minister for climate and energy is outspoken on this question. Uh, there is liberal um, parliamentarians who are very outspoken. Uh, Mrs. Agnes Stark-Zimmermann, she's doing very well fighting. Uh, but unfortunately, the chancellor's office is standing where they are. They are not going a step further. Uh, the Ministry of Defense uh, is, I think, acting according to um, the chancellor's office. Uh, so I think what must happen is that the Easter, Eastern European countries and the Northern countries have to tell Germany, you know what, you guys, we are really irritated about you. We were irritated when there was a special relation between Berlin and Moscow in all those years before, but that you don't understand that us, the Baltic States, and Poland, we are the ones who are actually standing in the front line. In the very front line, it's the Ukrainians fighting for us, but then it's Poland and Baltic. And we thought, as a consequence of the crimes of the Second World War, you would be standing at our side totally. And now we do not see common acting. And I think this is what the Chancellor's Office and the Chancellor, they have to get this message. Uh, they must get the message from Sweden and Finland, very pacifistic, peaceful countries, who obviously understood, otherwise they would not have asked to join NATO. Um, so I think what helps at the moment 
and I hope they are outspoken, is the Eastern European countries who tell how irritated they are about Berlin. I want to ask you also about another uh, this week's uh, big news. Uh, German media reported that former German Chancellor Gerhard Schroeder is in Moscow um, on holiday for a few days, as he said. His wife is saying an opposite thing, that he is making some deals on, on gas with Russia. Are, are you surprised that um, the former Chancellor is holding on uh, to his ties with Russia, even um, on the background of the full-scale invasion of Ukraine? No, I'm not surprised at all. I think he lost his decency already in 2005 with his Nord Stream 1 deal, where he stepped into Gazprom a few months later and made money on it. Much more money than any German chancellor ever can earn. Since then, for me, he has lost respect and I think he is now sitting in a jail which he has set up himself. So I don't, I don't think it's worthwhile talking about it. Uh, what is Germany preparing now uh, for um, in its gas relations with Russia? Because I know that there are many discussions what could happen and could Russia stop uh, supplying Germany with uh, gas at all? What are your expectations? Well, I mean, what is so unjust that um, the new government and the Green Minister now has to clean up the mess that has been created by Christian Democrats and uh, the Social Democrats because out of the last 16 years, 12 years they were in the same government together so they were the ones who with open eyes made germany almost totally dependent on russian gas how silly could we be there was so many debates where um the, everybody foreign minister steinmeier foreign minister gabriel uh, Dr. Hecker, who was uh, the advisor of Angela Merkel, they all said this Nord Stream 2 has nothing to do with politics. It was crazy already years ago. Everybody who was willing to see could see that it was a geostrategic project they didn't want to see. Okay, now. I think, yes, we have to pay, which means Germany, but the bigger price is being paid by Ukraine. So I think we are running into tough times I, for our economy, also for our people. Um, but I think we always have to remember that we might have a little less temperature. And yes, we, might, we will have problems in our industry. But look at our neighbors in Ukraine, what they are suffering. They are losing their husbands, sons, children. I think we have no reason to complain. It is the price for being so opportunistic, for wanting to make good money. It is the price. Thank you very much, Madam Beck, for this conversation. And thank you for your support of, of Ukraine. Thank you. Thank you.